The topic of my talk today is privatization. My motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. I have two arguments for this thesis. One is morality. That if we pr privatize things, then we act in, with regard to them in a voluntary way. If uh, shirt production is voluntary, uh, I sell you a shirt, you only get the shirt if you pay for it voluntarily. Whereas if it's done by the government and it's done through taxes, then I come get you for shirt money whether you want a shirt or not. And I think that coercion rends the social fabric. So the more we, we rely on markets and the less we rely on coercion, the better off we are. Okay, the next reason is economic efficiency, and there are several subcategories here. One is responsiveness and accountability. My claim here is that politicians and bureaucrats are far less responsive to voters than are entrepreneurs to customers. Uh, let me give you two examples of this from my experience when I lived in Canada. There was this department store, Eaton's, big department store, and one day they had in their display window picture uh, a mannequin, a, a male mannequin, a female mannequin, and the feminist, the local feminist determined that this was sexist. Don't ask. I, you know, I don't know. It's hard for me to know if it was or not, but let's stipulate that it was. And some sob sister uh, in the local paper wrote that this is a horrible thing and, you know, civilization is about to take a nosedive unless this display uh, uh, stopped. Guess how long it took for them to take that display down? A couple of hours. Next day it was gone. At about the same time there was this kid named Terry Fox. Anyone ever hear of him? Yeah. Terry Fox had one leg. And the other leg was a mechanical device because he had had cancer. And what he did is he ran across the whole bloody country, Canada, which is even wider than the U.S. I don't think he made it all the way he died. I think he made it <laughs> two-thirds of the way from eastern Canada to somewhere in Manitoba. <laughs> It was very heroic. They'd show pictures, you know, where he is on the news each day. And uh, he was a marathon runner, but, you know, with one leg, it's tough. But he would run a marathon every day, 26 miles a day across the country. And then he died, and uh, there was a, a great demand that, a, that Canada Post, that's the post office, uh, issue a, a commemorative stamp to illustrate or remember him. It took, I don't know, four or five, they finally did it, but it took like five years for them to do that? Well, you know, Canada Post doesn't have much competition. <laughs> you know, it's a monopoly. They can thumb their nose at the voters in a way that Eaton's department store can't thumb their nose at anyone. In the market, we vote daily. In the political sphere, we vote once every four years. In the market, we can vote for a blue shirt with uh, this stuff on it or not, or, uh, or, or a lousy shirt like Don's got. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he's such a good sport. He doesn't mind me picking on him. You're just jealous uh, that I have my visa. University I have one too. Ha -ha. <laughs> uh, so in the market, you can narrowly focus your uh, desires on whatever you want, pretty much. Anything. Weird, not weird. Uh, you want it, you can get it in the market. In the political sphere, you can't. I mean, you might like Bush, God forbid. <laughs> on policies 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, and you might like Kerry, God forbid, <laughs> on policies <laughs> 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. But you have no way of registering that in the political ballot box. You just go this one or that one. There's no choice. You can't get policies 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or, or any policies that, that anyone wants. Another reason for privatization and markets better than politics is profit and loss, a weeding out system. If you uh, make an Edsel, which is a Ford Motor Company car, and again, don't ask me why it was no good. It looked okay to me, but what do I know about cars? It used to be a joke. Johnny Carson, who was the, uh, what, what should I call it, the uh, Jay Leno of his day, <laughs> used to make Edsel jokes. Edsels were stupid. Well, Ford Motor Company lost millions, billions of dollars on that, and they had to stop it. Otherwise, they would have gone the way of Chrysler, which we know no longer exists. No, wait, that's not right. <laughs> Chrysler still exists because of government bailouts because the people decided that they don't like Chrysler products in sufficient quantity to keep them in business and the government uh, overrode them. 
Whereas in the market, the, there's mutual benefit in the ex ante sense. Every time you buy a newspaper for a buck, you value that newspaper at more than a buck, and they value it at less than a buck, and you most, both of you profiteer off of each other. Mutual benefit in the market. The price system mobilizes information, the Hayek insight, the public choice insight is that people don't sprout angels' wings when they go into public service. They're still trying to look out for number one, but now they look out for number one in a milieu of uh, coercion, not voluntariness. Okay, so that's the general case for the market. And it applies to markets in everything. I'm going to apply it to roads, highways, streets, thoroughfares like that. In my lecture in I forget what day it is on environmentalism. I apply it to oceans, rivers, lakes, puddles, things like that. Let me just say a few words about that with, with regard to the oceans, sort of as a teaser. Um, world GDP comes from the land about, I'm guessing, 98%, and from the waters, 2%. Whereas the land is 75% of the Rather, the land is 25% and accounts for 98% of the GDP, whereas the oceans are 75% of the Earth's surface and account for only 2%. There's a little disconnect there. We are now on the oceans the way we were on land in the caveman days, hunting and fishing. No farming in the oceans. It's an irrational, unowned uh, tragedy of the commons thing, and it's just ripe for research in how would you privatize it? And there are various theories on this, and I'll get into that a bit, as I say, uh, when I talk about uh, this topic. Today, what I want to talk about is roads and highways. Why so radical? Why not uh, talk about privatizing the post office or Air Canada, which is a Canadian airline? In many countries, the, the airline is a public airline. Or the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company in, in Canada and in many other countries. The, the TV stations are owned by the government. Isn't that amazing? You know? So you get a government TV station and uh, commenting on politicians. It's sort of incestuous to the ultimate degree. Well, the reason I'm not interested in that is sort of like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, the case for privatizing that stuff is so easy. No one's going to say, well, you want to privatize the post office? You're a maniac. You know, get out. Uh, it, it's not much of a challenge, whereas roads and other things are more of a challenge. People really can't see how a private road would work. So I want to apply free enterprise principles to the hard cases, because if we can show that free enterprise principles apply to the hard cases, then obviously they'll apply to the easy ones as well. Whereas if we confine ourselves only to the easy ones, and I'm not against doing it for the easy ones, but I'm just saying let's do hard ones too, then we can make the case for the market much more robust. Let's take the offense, and let's not be on the defense. My particular um, interest in roads is, anyone know how many people die on the roads every year? About 40,000 40, people die on the roads every year. The Vietnam War, which was a paroxysm of, of craziness uh, 20 years ago in our country, killed only 50,000 US servicemen in the four, five, or six years we were in Vietnam. Only 50,000, whereas here it's 40,000 die like flies on the road, and yet this isn't uh, in the uh, newspapers, it's not in the, in the, in the, on the radio or TV, the political conventions don't talk about it. You know, they say death and taxes are, you know, what is it, inevitable, so you, you, you don't worry about it, you don't think about it. Well, my view is that these road deaths are not inevitable, they are a function of socialist roads. And if we privatize the roads, we could reduce this by a great degree. I have, one of my articles is an open letter to MAD, M-A-D-D, oh. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And one of my claims is that they are in a very, very bad position vis-a-vis -vis the roads compared to the position that Docs Unlimited is uh, with regard to the environment. Because these left-wing environmental groups, in addition to uh, going to Washington to ask for favors, can also buy land and put in uh, their own policies. MAD cannot buy a road and say, look, we're running this MAD road, and you know, if you drink, we're going to, whatever, <laughs> uh, haul you off by your toes or something. They don't have that option to have a demonstration. 
So I have this open letter to Matt. I figured they'd write for conversion, but um, somehow it doesn't happen yet, but keep trying. Okay, so let's talk about road socialism. And some people object, oh, you know, you're being too harsh, you're calling them road socialists, uh, you know, get more flies with honey than with vinegar or something. I say if the shoe fits, wear it. If it walks like a socialist, if it quacks like a socialist, you know, maybe it is a socialist, and the, the roads seem to be very socialistic. 99% uh, of people see nothing wrong with, with road socialism. I, I mentioned that I once got into a debate with Milton Friedman, and I accused him of that, and he didn't much like it, which is the view of most people when I come after them. Okay, this is dismissed as crazy and, and, and weird, and everyone knows you can't have it, and if you had private roads, we'd have chaos. Does anyone know what the first roads in this country were? Take a guess. They were private. They were turnpike roads. They didn't have cement. They didn't have macadam, uh, sort of the, the tar kind of thing. They were just uh, dirt roads. And the people who had the roads, or sometimes they would have boards across them, uh, the people who had the roads had interesting ways of charging for it. Uh, if you were walking, you would ch be charged much less. If you had a horse, you'd be charged a little bit more. If you had a wagon, they charged you based on the number of axles in your wagon and the heaviness or how much stuff was in there. They even charged you on the basis of width of the wheel of the wagon. If the wagon wheel was wide, you paid very little. Think steamroller, it smooths out the ruts in the road. On the other hand, if you had a very narrow wheel, the, the wagon would go fast, but it would rip up the road. Think of ice skates on the land. You know, as you go, you dig a gouge or you gouge in the road. So it was a pretty sophisticated thing uh, for the early days before the, the start even of the country. Uh, they would manage it. They would construct it. They would charge tolls. Eventually, this came to a halt because the government refused to uphold in law their right to charge tolls. Well, if you can't charge tolls, then you can't have a private enterprise. I mean, if they wouldn't allow you to charge for a shirt, uh, my prediction as an Austrian, pardon the expression, is you're not going to have much of a shirt industry if the government won't enforce on you that you have to pay for a shirt when I give you a shirt. Now, there are arguments from mainstream economists, no, 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 uh, roads are a public good. And you can't exclude, and there's non-rivalrousness, and they go into these long songs and dances about public goodness and public goods, and therefore, you know, you can't, you can't do it. Well, I say, just because the government can't exclude non-payers doesn't mean that private people can't. And the, the whole rivalrousness stuff is, is sort of crazy, because what that means is that if there's any place that's not filled to capacity, then you can't charge for it. Look, there's a whole row of seats here. Uh, there are a few empty seats in the back. Uh, we shouldn't be allowed to charge here because we're not full to capacity. Therefore, th there's non-rivalrousness. Namely, if somebody were to sit right over there, uh, he would not impose any costs on us. Lou wouldn't be upset that there are people in here that he hasn't invited, <laughs> which is ridiculous. So the mainstream economic argument against this, I think, is easily dismissible. What is the job of economists under road socialism? There are a lot of jobs. Uh, this is a constant refrain for me, looking at the quo bono, who benefits, and, and trying to see if that explains why people have certain views. Well, there's this NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which uh, employs, I don't know, hundreds of economists doing regressions on, on all sorts of weird and exotic things. All those jobs be gone like that. Uh, there's a whole bunch, there's a whole industry dedicated to public roads. People get subsidies for it, the <coughs> trucking, whatever. No? I have this fetish. Anyone coughs in my class, I throw a cough drop at them. It's sort of like, if all you have a, is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So if you have cancer, I'll give you a cough drop. <laughs> <laughs> the way most people in the economics profession look upon privatization of roads is roughly the way the economists in the uh, Soviet uh, collectivized farms looked at privatizing farms. You know, it's just utterly, totally ridiculous. 
Okay, so my main reason for road privatization is to illustrate, or one of the reasons for using this, uh, talking about this is to illustrate yet again the benefits of the market vis-a-vis -vis the government. In other words, to save vast numbers of lives. Uh, a minor thing is traffic congestion. When I used to live in New York, we had this uh, expression for the Long Island Expressway. It's about 100 miles long. It goes from Queens, I guess, out to Montauk. We'd call it the longest parking lot in the world <laughs> because it was just bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. And uh, L.A. traffic is, is ridiculous. I mean, they say that the fastest way to get around most cities is on a little scooter or a bicycle or roller skates or something. They say that horses and wagons went faster uh, in the days before cars, then the choked up roads go now. Uh, so that's a minor irritant, but it's not unrelated to deaths because you have road rage where people, you know, get out of the car and start shooting each other because the car in front of them isn't moving and can't move because the car in front of them isn't moving, but what the heck. Okay, so let's get into the specifics. One argument against me, if you ask anyone what is the cause of motor uh, fatalities, they'll give you a list and the top ones will be speed, drunken driving, and uh, driver error. They'll say, look, the, the reason we have these massive deaths on the highway has got nothing to do with road socialism or anything like that. It's not government. You, you libertarians are loony. You can't blame uh, government uh, for that. It, it's these causes. There's this um, guy, Sam Peltzman, a University of Chicago economist, in parentheses, socialist. And he has a whole bunch of reasons why, uh, in addition to this, vehicle speed, or including this, alcohol consumption, the number of young drivers, because young drivers are less safe than older coots like us, Don, <laughs> changes in driver's income, because they buy a new car and they, there's a time period where they have to get used to the car. The money costs of accidents, the average age of cars, the older the car, the less safe. The ratio of new cars to all cars, because it had been suggested that while drivers familiarize themselves with the new cars, accident risk may increase. This is Sam Peltzman. Traffic density, expenditures on traffic law enforcement by state highway patrols, expenditures on roads. The ratio of imports to total cars, because there's evidence that small cars are more lethal, uh, small imports. The education of the population, the availability of hospital care, which might reduce deaths, the time it takes for, uh, uh, what do you call it, an ambulance to get to the accident and back. These are the causes. The NHSTA has 103 reasons. Very detailed, like uh, uh, the ornaments on the hood. Somehow if you have an ornament on the hood that, that will cut people up, I don't know. It, it just goes on and on. Now, my claim is that this is all a confusion of ultimate cause with proximate cause. Yes, these are the proximate causes. Look, let's try it on a restaurant. Suppose we're uh, management consultants, we're analysts, and we're, we're now looking at a restaurant that went broke. And we start making lists as to why the restaurant went broke. And we say, lousy food, uh, place was dirty. What else? Uh, you know, uh, location, location, location. They're located on a cul-de-sac. Nobody knows where the restaurant is. And you have other reasons. You know, the waitress is a surly and on and on. Would we for a moment accept this as a, a full ultimate explanation as to why the restaurant went broke? <coughs> Never in a million years. What will we say instead? The bad manager. It's the manager who's in charge of hiring cooks. It's the manager who's in charge of hiring people with brooms. It's the manager who picked the location. We would say it's the manager. Well, similarly, we have to say the same thing here. It's the manager. And guess who is the manager? The manager is the government. So it's the government's fault. Let me give you another example of that. Suppose I take a gun and I shoot Dawn. And now you guys capture me. You're marching me off to jail. I say, wait, wait a second. I didn't shoot him. It was the bullet. I didn't come close to him. I'm, I'm 10 feet away from him. Well, in a sense, I'm right. I didn't really kill him. It was the bullet that was the proximate cause. I was just the ultimate cause. Leave me alone. I'm innocent. No, we wouldn't accept that in a million years. I'm not innocent. I'm the ultimate cause. The bullet was the proximate cause. These things are proximate causes. The ultimate cause is the manager. 
I got several of my articles into managerial journals because <laughs> they appreciate, you know, the importance of managers. They probably didn't read the rest of the stuff, you know, which is calling for the privatization of roads, but all's fair in love, war, and trying to publish in non-Austrian libertarian journals. <laughs> so you do what you can. The manager or the businessman is the residual income claimant. He's the one that uh, sells the stuff and then gets whatever is left over, profit or loss, after all the expenses are gone. The reason restaurants are pretty good is because the bad ones go broke. The reasons roads aren't so good is because the bad managers don't go broke. Whenever there's a big smack up on the highway, 15 people die. Does any manager of a road lose money? No. Silly. I mean, it just doesn't even arise. The whole issue doesn't arise. And yet, the reason we have good shirts and good pizza and good uh, lights like this is because the people who produce these things badly go broke. So the ones who are remain are, you know, pretty decent. Given the human condition that, you know, perfection is denied us on this side of heaven or whatever, most things work pretty well in the free enterprise system because of this weeding out process of inefficiency. But under socialism, there's no weeding out. So why should we expect things to run well? Why should we, this is the incentive problem of socialism. There are other problems that uh, Joe Salerno went into, and I'm not saying I'm covering the whole waterfront, but this is a serious problem. Okay, so how would they work? And now I have in my notes a whole song and a dance about, um, at this time in my public lectures, I'm usually being booed. <laughs> and I, I have a whole five minutes about shut up and stop booing me and listen, <laughs> which is important. I mean, you know, when I first started this business, I figured, you know, I'd just give the, su the substance to stuff. I didn't realize that I had to, I don't know, seduce them into listening to me. <laughs> But in this audience, I think I'll just skip by that stuff and talk about how would it work. <laughs> okay, so how would it work? Well, it would work like any other business. Uh, somebody once asked, I think there was a question, if you guys are so smart, why aren't you rich? No, no. You asked, if you're so smart, why aren't you more popular in, in the oh, economics yeah, profession? Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a famous uh, um, example of, of a wealthy businessman asking an economist, if you're so smart, why, why are you rich? And he says, if you're so rich, why are you so stupid? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the distinction here, the, the explanation for this is that there's a difference between theory and entrepreneurship. The guy who is rich is smart in entrepreneurship. I don't care if he's got an IQ of 12. You know, they say Ray Kroc was stupid, he didn't get out of high school, he made McDonald's. Well, he might not have been a good theoretician, but he did something right, because he earned his money honestly and he earned a lot of money. The reason that is because this is entrepreneurship. And what I'm trying to say is that I'm not a road entrepreneur. I'm not a business person. I don't know really how to run roads. No one does. There are no road entrepreneurs. So all I can do is speculate as to what kind of a thing would happen. So it's just like any other business, or perhaps it's a loss leader. You know, there are firms that give you road service for free in order to entice you in there. Disney World doesn't charge you for road usage or those paths. The supermarket doesn't charge you to walk up and down their internal roads. The shopping center has roads too. And there's this place called the Edmonton Mall. I don't know why all my examples have come from Canada, but it's, who knows. Uh, the Edmonton Mall is located, you'll never guess where, in Edmonton. <laughs> Edmonton's a very cool place in the winter. It's freezing. And there are joggers who like to jog. So what they do in the Edmonton Mall, which has got miles and miles of internal corridors, is they open it up at 5 in the morning just for joggers. The stores don't open until 8. And they give them this free service as sort of an advertising thing. There are condominium developments that have internal roads. So I don't say you have to charge for roads. It's possible that all roads would be given for free as a, a way that entrepreneurs would attract you to whatever it is that they're selling, sort of like an advertising thing. So it's a possibility. I don't know what proportion will be given for free and what not, but let's suppose that the proportion that will be given for free is less than 100%, so that there will other be roads that will be charged. 
okay, you want to build a new road, you've got to assemble land, attract investors, hire a labor force, build it, charge for it, set up the rules of the road, fill in the potholes, put on road signs, make traffic lights. That's another criticism of the market. They always say, well, who will make the traffic lights? Well, the, the road owner will. <laughs> who makes the, the lights here? Lou did. Uh, I, he, not personally, but you know, he hired somebody to make the, the lights. Who makes, puts the lights in um, Walmart? The Walmart people. Uh, th this idea of, of traffic lights or what do you call it, street light lamp things, lamp posts, that, that's a ludicrous criticism of the market to say that the market can't create things like that. What kind of safety devices might be used by private enterprises that are not now used? My first article on this came out in the 60s. And events have overtaken me. They've actually started using some of the stuff that I was suggesting then. For example, one of them is every once in a while you see a bunch of crosses off to the side of a road, and that means that that number of people died. And it sort of gives you pause for thought. One of mine was, uh, you know what, what an accordionized car is? Schmushed. <laughs> you know, a car that's maybe five feet long that used to be 30 feet long because it got schmushed. Put one of them suckers up on a pedestal and that'll give people pause for thought. Just the thought. I don't know if it'll work. But I do know that if some road owners do it and some don't, and some make profits and others don't, then the market will give an answer that I, as a non-entrepreneur, can't give. Um, you see, the problem of anticipating the market, suppose shoes were always done publicly. And I, crazy, said we should privatize shoes. In, immediately, critics would say, well, who would uh, you know, put the laces on the shoes? Or would we have uh, uh, slippers or shoes? And what about sneakers? And how would the poor get shoes? And, and you know, where would the shoe stores be located? And what color would the shoes be? I'd have to say, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I'm not a shoe entrepreneur. All I know is that those who do this right will make profits and prosper, and those who screw up the shoe in whatever way you can screw it up, and I don't know, will lose, and we'll rationalize the shoe market. Well, that's all I'm saying about roads. We'll rationalize the road market. What other kinds of things might be used? Well, Maybe higher fines for speeding. I don't know. Maybe um, uh, dangerous driving roads. You know, sometimes kids like to play um, chicken. What is it when, when you ride against each other? Chicken. chicken. Uh, maybe uh, between 1 and 5 in the morning, some roads would be used for that. <laughs> now, the death, the death rate there would go high, but at least they'd be knocking off each other. <laughs> And, and they'd leave the rest of us alone? You know, thinning out the herd? <laughs> Look, what, <laughs> when I say that there are 40,000 people dying now, I don't think that under free enterprise there'll be zero. But I, I think it'll be much less. Well, some of these maniacs, you know, maybe uh, they'll go off to the, their just reward without taking us with them, which would reduce the overall death rate. Minimum speeds. Right now, do you know what the minimum speed on the, the big highway is? 40. 40. I used to drive a, a Honda CC90, which on a downhill with a tailwind, I can get up to 40 <laughs> <laughs> with, with no passenger. <laughs> but if I had a passenger, I was going uphill against the wind, you know, 28, 30. But I'd get on the highway and I'd be moving along. And, and you know when the, the, the minimum speed is 40 and the maximum is 70? If you go up to 79, they probably won't give you a ticket. Although they're so arbitrary and capricious, uh, sort of, um, uh, they'll do 80, 85. You know, I'm, I'm going along at 80 and people are <laughs> zooming right by me. So the variation in speed is tremendous. You get these little old lady types who drive just maybe at 45 miles an hour in the middle lane, not even on the right lane. And then they sort of, sometimes in the left lane, there's no ticket for that, and then you have to go around and you beep and everyone's going berserk. And <laughs> but that's what they do. Now maybe what you should do is have different speed limits in different lanes. Maybe instead of a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 70 in all three lanes, maybe what you should do is uh, here you have to do 55, here you have to do 70, and here you have to do 85. 
Now, I don't know if those are the right numbers. All I do know is that if different road companies experiment, then you'll have advertising. The Acme Road will say, well, look, this is what we do, and our death rate has really gone down. Whereas the uh, Don Prince Road, that's uh, smack up highway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Lousy roads that, that he's got, and uh, come patronize my road, right? I mean, you'd have competition. Now, I don't know if this is right, but I do know that the rules of the road are not given to us from on high on stone tablets or from Congress. <laughs> The rules, of the, road, the rules of the road that will minimize deaths come from experience. It's not apodictic. Austrians aren't saying everything is apodictic. Everything is in praxeology. This is an empirical issue. But we just have one size fits all right now. Uh, what else? Cat's eyes. You know, those reflective beams. Um, stripes. I was driving here from the Atlanta airport and it was raining and I couldn't see the bloody road because the, the paint wasn't as good as it should have been. On the other hand, I just, someone gave me this thing from the Scotsman. Who is that? Is he here? Somebody just handed this to me a, a, a day or so ago. And what they're saying is what you should do is make roads more dangerous appearing so that people will go slower. <laughs> The ultimate there is, instead of seat belts and, and airbags, put a, a sword right in front. <laughs> <laughs> and, now, and now everyone will, will drive at around 15 miles an hour. Now, I don't know if this will work. I'm just tossing these out as possible scenarios, way to go. And, and I assume that the marketplace will have many different ways of proceeding, and then we'll find out what works best on the approach to the Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver, the lanes were very, very narrow, so people went slow. They widened the lanes, and people go faster. It's as if people want have a certain optimal amount of danger in their gut, and if you make it safer, like with airbags or seat belts, they go faster. So maybe what we ought to do is ban seat belts. Again, I don't know. But these are sort of thoughts that we should be thinking about if we're uh, road theoreticians. Okay, now I've established the case for private roads, and now what I'll do is consider a bunch of objections to it that have been made in the literature, uh, some of which I, 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 I must have about 10 articles on roads. I, actually, I'm having a book coming out on that. Yeah, the, the reason I don't have Defending the Two is because I'm doing this now, and I've got about 15 articles on roads, and I'm putting them all together, and and I've got a book coming out with Edward Mellon Press on all these articles, plus a few more articles. A vicious attack on Bob Poole of the Reason uh, Foundation for compromising and working with the NHTSA. Evil, evil. Okay, one objection to this is that if you did this, every three feet you'd have to stop and put a penny in some little old lady's coin box as you, you know, <laughs> you're going down the street here and different people own... Um, houses on the street, and you'd have to put in a penny every, you know, it would just, I mean, even make traffic congestion worse. Well, that's a really weird way to privatize. In other words, here you have a road, and here's the median, and here are all these houses, and what you're really saying is that this house, one, gets to own this section of road, and this house, two, gets to own that section. And here is house uh, three, and here is house four, and house four owns that. Sort of like, you know the game Parcheesi, where the goal is to put two of your men in so that uh, no one can get past you? So if these two guys said, okay, we're going to charge a million bucks to get by this road, that road is gone. And even if they didn't, you know, the idea that you'd have to pay a penny every time you went anywhere is just the... Uh, would stop this one coal. But that's no way to privatize. That's not the way roads originally were run. You know, we, we, uh, Murray spoke in his uh, speech in Stanford about how would you privatize the Soviet Union. Well, one way to privatize the Soviet Union is take a, a steel factory and, you know, give you a brick and you a brick and, and everyone now would have a veto power over running the place. Another more rational way is to say, 
okay, uh, we're giving this steel mill to this town and there are 10,000 people in this town. Each one of them gets a share in the new company of the steel mill. And now you vote for a board of directors, which would be much more rational. So if you gave all the people on this Elm Street here one over N share of the whole road and then they s set up a company, then you wouldn't have that problem. So that, that's a way out of that objection. Or, it, or if you had a limited highway from going, I don't know, from where, from Atlanta to uh, Dallas. There's the highway from Atlanta to Dallas. Forget about who you give it to. One, let's, pay, let's suppose it's all within one state. Another case comes from Canada. It's called the British Columbia Resources Investment Corporation. They had a whole bunch of oh, um, lumber mills and farms and copper mines and this and that and the other, all of which was owned by the government, and then they privatized it. And what they did is they gave five shares in this new company, this new private company, to every citizen of British Columbia, and it was a private company. So you could give it out to all the people that live between Atlanta and Dallas or some road in Alabama, just give it to all the Alabanians, Alabamians, or whatever they are. <laughs> okay, the second objection, or the next objection, is the blockade. You come out of your house, here's your house. No, it looks like a face, but there's your house. You come out of your house and the guy says, oh, well, welcome to my road, that'll be a million dollars. Or he says, you can't come on my road. Now you start thinking, well, should I get a pole vault? You know, I'm not really a world champion pole vaulter, you know, sort of jump over it. Or do I have to get a helicopter to get off my land? Well, this too is, is not a reasonable objection. My answer to this is right now when you buy a house, if you have any sense at all, you hire a lawyer, and what the lawyer does is looks into the title of the property to make sure that somebody else doesn't claim it and you'll have to be in court with them. So you have title search and there are insurance companies called title insurance companies that will insure you against bad title. Well, under a regime of private roads, in addition to title search, you'll have a thing called access search. Namely, the lawyer will find out. Well, you know, can you get out onto this road? Can you tie them up contractually so they don't pull that on you? Right? And if you can't, you're not buying that house. Now, start with a new house, a, a new road. They start this road from Atlanta to Dallas. And they, do they want people to locate on the side of that road? Yes, because the more people that locate, the more people will use the road. They, they're not building a road for aesthetic enjoyment. They're building a road to, you know, get people to be customers. Well, how are they going to entice people? Are people going to be so st stupid as to say, okay, I'll buy, you know, a thousand acres over here and never inquire or contractually obligate them not to blockade them in there? No. What this company will have to do is to entice people to locate alongside it, is contractually obligate themselves or contractually preclude themselves from this blockade kind of a thing. So that would be my answer to that. What's the next one? Who determines the rules of the road? There'd be chaos with different roads, uh, different rules. Everywhere in the civilized world, as far as I know, you drive on the right side, except in England. Weirdos in England. Where else? Japan. Japan? Weirdos in Japan too? <laughs> Will you people stop ruining my... <laughs> they have no respect, Don. <laughs> Rotten kids. Most places you drive on the right like normal human beings. <laughs> there are a few weirdos <laughs> that drive elsewhere. Now Sweden is a very interesting case in point because Sweden is the only one that I know that switched from the one to the other. They used to drive, I forget which way they switched. It's not true? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can we kick that guy out? They did switch in 1960. Yeah, they, they did switch. This is probably before you were born, you young pup. 
they, they did switch, according to the research I've done. I've published on this. And I don't know, maybe I'll be struck I'm dead if it didn't happen. I'm not saying they did not. I'm saying that they were not the only one. Ah, okay. Well, I don't know about others. I do know about the Swedish case. Falklands? They were, they were switched over after the fight, and the, the British came back and switched them back. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there were other, other cases that switched. So I stand corrected. I said they were the only ones that switched. I, I was wrong. Sorry. You know, it's funny. Before I took up my career, such as it is in public speaking, I used to think, God forbid, one day I'll make an error and people will see me a moron, exposed for the moron that I am. And then I realized, you know, I'm just uh, doing the best I can, and, you know, I missed up on this one. I didn't know about the Falklands. You know, sue me. I made a mistake. <laughs> what can I tell you? What happened in Sweden was that, well, I'm saying this as a hint for you people, if you're afraid of public speaking, it doesn't hurt, so you make an error. Big deal. You know, you just do your best. That's all you can do. Okay. What they did in Sweden is they had announcements for a year before the switchover. You know, on you know, January 1st, uh, 1980 or whenever it was, we're switching over. And then uh, when they got closer to it, like in December, there, there'd be signs and there'd be interviews. And, and, you know, it was a real big thing to switch over from one side to the other. So the point I'm trying to make is you could have different rules of the road, maybe different speed limits maybe different requirements for seat belts or something. But you can't have somebody <laughs> driving on the right side and then the next road you go on the left side. That would just be too disparate. So there has to be some cooperation between the different road owners. They have to coordinate. By the way, does anyone know how um, time zones were first established? Railroads, private railroads, not government railroads, established this because they had to have schedules. Does anyone know how standard gauge, namely the, the, the width of the rail is 5, 6, I think it is? Somebody's going to correct me and say it's 5, 8 or 5. that it was um, the, the width of the, um, uh, the horse and buggy wheels, but I think that's false. I don't know what, what it was. All I know is that the way it emanated, the way it came about, the genesis of it was um, contractual agreements on the part of the different railroad companies. Because, you know, you, one guy is this wide, the next guy is narrow gauge, and the next guy is this. And you have to take stuff off this car and put it on that car. So they negotiated this. So what I'm saying, if the railroads, which are long, thin things, can negotiate over time zones and width of track, well, then surely all the private owners in any area can say, look, we're, we're, we're right-wingers, you drive on the right, or we're left-wingers, you drive on the left. It doesn't matter as long as in any given geographical area, everyone is standard. So what I'm saying is the rules of the road can be divergent one from the other, but not too, too divergent. Because if they're too divergent, you know, you're going to have chaos. So this example is making me think that if you have private organizations running these roads, like say there is a road that people are riding on the opposite side, people can complain. They'll realize that what they're doing is obviously ludicrous, and they'll change. You can't do that with the public. You'll never find a phone number for this. Right. Okay, another um, point is uh, congestion. The, the, the next uh, issue is congestion. How would the market deal with congestion, and how does the government deal with congestion? And the key to the congestion problem, well, first let me illustrate what I mean by congestion or rush hours, is if this is time of the day and this is frequency of travel, from, oh, I don't know, uh, say 8 p.m. until 8 a.m., the traffic is pretty low. From 8 a.m. to, say, 9.30, a.m. The traffic is high. That's the morning rush hour. Then it gets a little less. Now, this is not New York City or L.A. where it's, you know, just traffic all the time, even 3 in the morning. But in most places, now you get, say, to 4.30 to 6. Again, you have a peak. Th that's the usual pattern of traffic. The solution to this problem is called peak load pricing. What you do is you try to flatten it out. Namely, you charge high here, high there. Here you charge very little. 
and you try to reduce it. So increase it to this and maybe that. And if you do the dotted thing, you sort of try to iron out the traffic pattern. And if you iron it out, then you have less congestion. What does the government do? Does the government have peak load pricing? No. They have anti-peak load pricing. Anti-peak load pricing is they charge less for the peaks and more for the off periods. So what they do is exacerbate the, the variance. How does this work? It's not on roads, but it's mainly on tunnels and bridges. You know, the, these easy pass things, right? If you buy an easy pass for, you know, 30 trips, do you get each trip a little cheaper or a little bit more expensive? A little cheaper, right? Who is likely to use a monthly pass? A commuter or somebody who goes into town once in a while? A commuter, obviously. Who is likely to go during the peak load periods? A commuter. So what you're doing is you're giving the people that use the peaks a break. So they're, you're exacerbating it. You're increasing the peaks and therefore decreasing the troughs. You're worsening it. And in addition, what they have is this nonsense about, what is it, um, uh, carpooling? <laughs> Who's going to carpool? It's a pain in the neck. It's inconvenient. The way to carpool is to have peak load pricing, and then people would naturally carpool on the basis of the invisible hand. In other words, if it costs 50 bucks to get across that bridge, now you're going to seriously think about carpooling. Yeah? I was in Seattle and actually they do the same thing. They do peak load pricing. In the buses, they charge more in the peak hours. So I thought more in the peak hours. Well, then that's yeah. an exception. I'm talking about uh, most places when they do highways and tunnels, that's one exception. I didn't know about that. But what you have is anti-peak load pricing. And then they have these HOV, high occupancy vehicle lanes which is the, the most outrageous thing because what happens in LA, or at least my experience there, is that the people in the non-HOV are so ticked off at these guys going whizzing by, so they go bumper to bumper, so you can't get off them. So if you want to get off, you have to stop, which stops the whole thing. Now Bob Poole, my buddy on this, what he does is he consults with the NHTSA to have not HOV, high occupancy vehicle, but high value, I forget what he calls it, namely if you want to pay more then you can get Hot through. Lane. Sorry? Hot lanes. Hot lanes. Uh, which is rational. But, but the guy, it's, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that if I was in the Soviet Union and I, I was consulting with the, the guys that were running the uh, Soviet steel mill and I was saying, well look, do this more efficiently, wouldn't I be part of the enemy? I mean, I'm not supposed to be making the government run more efficiently. As a libertarian, I'm supposed to be ending it. <laughs> or take Nazi Germany. I go to Hitler and I say, look Hitler, you know, your problem is you're not killing them efficiently enough. You've got to use this gas or you've got to, you know, put the ovens this way. Uh, your ovens are in the wrong direction. Now, am I a libertarian? <laughs> I don't think so. Now, it's true that the government can read my publications and say, aha, look at all the stuff Block is saying. We can do it. Well, I'm not going to stop publishing because of that. Now, maybe I'm just making a mountain out of a molehill or I'm making a distinction where there's no distinction, but I see a distinction between uh, spending reason money to go and set up a conference for these bureaucrats and tell them, you know, tell them all about free enterprise to make the, the public roads more efficient. Well, maybe it's just my personality. I don't know. Okay, what else have we got? You don't need high tech to do this. What you could do is superimpose a bullseye over a city and charge more to go into the central business corridor. And they did that in Singapore with different colors that you put on your windshield or something. So you don't need high tech. You can be very low tech. And if you're caught, God forbid, here where you only have a permit here, case over for you. Okay, now I'm going to save the most uh, serious objection. 
Ah, here's one more minor objection. Why pay anything for roads? Right now we get them for free. We have freeways. Well, this is a very unsophisticated argument because we obviously pay for it through taxes. They should be called taxways instead of freeways. I know the freeways, uh, that's not why they're called freeways. It's because of limited access, but still, they should be calling them taxways. Okay, now the most serious objection that I want to spend a, a bit of time on is something that happened. I was at this conference with my son. He was about 14. And Gordon Tullock comes up to me and says, Block, I hear you're a maniac, no news there, and that you favor private roads. And then Gordon draws for me a picture of the United States and stop laughing about how my picture of the United States, here's Long Island, and <laughs> <laughs> this is Texas. They have no respect on <laughs> young whippersnappers. And what he said is, you could build a road from Boston to LA, and you would cut off the country into two, something that even the war of northern aggression didn't succeed in doing, right? And I said, but Gordon, um, you know, wouldn't pay <laughs> uh, to do this because if there were no access routes on or off and no uh, crossroads, you know, the, the, the present ca discounted capital of the value of this road wouldn't be very high. I said, yeah, I agree with you, but you still, you could do it. And my son and I, for the next two or three years, we talked about pretty much nothing else but that. <laughs> Could you do it? W is this a, a fair uh, objection? Or do you need what's called eminent domain? See, eminent domain means, like if you want to go from here to here, and you know, Gordon's got his road there, <laughs> and he's not letting you go by. Gordon Talk is a pretty eminent economist. He's James Buchanan's co-author. He didn't win the Nobel Prize, but he's on the short list of people who could win it. He's a pretty respected member of the economics profession. Okay, so let's talk about eminent domain. I have several arguments on this. One is, you don't really need eminent domain. Eminent domain is a seizure of land, right? The government comes and seizes it. I want to build a road from, what's this, Chicago to uh, New Orleans. And it's uh, 500 miles. And uh, Don here is a holdout. <laughs> He's got this little family farm over here and says, sure, I'll sell it to you for, you know, 10 trillion. Otherwise, don't bother me. Okay, there are various ways to conquer eminent domain without government uh, doing eminent domain. There are various ways to assemble a highway without the government coming in and expropriating farmers, taking over their private property. One of the ways is a thing called options. What's options? Well, I want to build a road from A to B, and my ideal path is there. But I could go here, I could go there, I could go there, I could go there. And what I do is I go to each of these five or six routes, and I buy options to buy. I say, Don, would you sell me your property? I'm not buying your property, but I just want to buy an option to buy your property. Now, the property might be worth, say, a million bucks. But an option to buy, and I have to exercise it within a certain period of time, otherwise I lose it, I can maybe pay him a thousand bucks, very small fee, and if he agrees to a million, I can then exercise my option at my discretion, so I start buying options here, let's say this road, and all of a sudden I run into a holdout. I don't exercise any of those options. I just go on this road. By the way, every once in a while, to get off roads, just for a second talk about eminent domain, every once in a while you go to a city. Most cities, the, the buildings, you know, they own this much area, and then they have a skyscraper there. But every once in a while you go to a city block, and there's this little stupid house right there. <laughs> can, can you all see it in the back? The little stupid house. And the, the skyscraper is sort of shaped in a funny way to sort of build around that stupid little house. Well, I'll tell you something. You won't find any of that in Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union. Because in Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union, they just get rid of these guys. Now, lately, what they've been doing with eminent domain is they've been taking over private property <laughs> 
from some little old lady and giving it to Donald Trump to build a parking lot or to build a, a gambling establishment. I had a debate with Richard Epstein, who is supposedly a free enterpriser, you know, one of these Chicago socialist free enterprisers. <laughs> and we had a debate on that, and he was obviously opposing that. But he says, well, there are certain things you need, uh, you know, eminent domain for, for example, highways and roads. Well, one way out of that is the options way. Another way is you tunnel under or you build a bridge over. You get it? Here's the holdout. He's got this 100 acres. Uh, the options don't work. And he says, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> not selling. Hoo -hoo. Well, I dig under a tunnel. Or I build a bridge over. Now, it's true it'll cost a little more, but it's not going to cost $1 trillion that he wants. But doesn't this violate private property rights? Is the argument, the obvious argument. Now, the argument on the basis of which it does violate property rights is called a thing called ad colum. Ad colum is the doctrine that if you own land on the surface of the earth, say you own a square mile, you also own a decreasing cone down toward the center of the earth. You get it? You own, a, uh, say, a square mile, you own down into the core of the earth in a decreasing cone, so it looks like a, a, an ice cream cone. And you also own an area up into the heavens. Right? That's the ad column doctrine. This is the argument that Milton Friedman was giving me when we had this little debate. But it's not a libertarian doctrine. The libertarian doctrine of property rights is the way you get property rights is by homesteading them. You didn't homestead anything at 25,000 feet. Mm -hmm. You can't be charging a plane who's going up above at 25,000 feet and making him stop every time he goes over some little old lady's house and drop a penny. Because <laughs> you didn't homestead it. The people at home said it were the people up there. So then I said, well, you know, if I own this land and you own this land, I can dig down here and there's oil under your property or a diamond under your property or whatever it is, and I can uh, take it. And you say, oh no, this is a violation of property rights. Namely, he was espousing the incorrect ad colon doctrine according to which everyone owns under their stuff. Now, it's true, I can't be digging right under your house and your house caves in. <laughs> That's a violation of your property rights. Nor can I buzz you with an airplane <laughs> You know, three feet above your house? <laughs> Can't do that. But, and, and it depends upon how solid the earth is. If it's rock, I can go pretty close under your house without caving in your house. If it's sort of sandy, swampy stuff, I'd better stay 500 feet below you otherwise. But forget about that. You don't own down into the core of the earth, nor do you own up into the heavens. So it's a perfectly legitimate thing to deal with the holdout. Someone asked me about my next um, defending the undefendable. The holdout as hero, defending private property rights, would be one case. I forget whether I've got it, but if I don't, I'll start writing it. My son and I published an article based on this, and then he was only 16 or 17 and I wrote it all up and he didn't really want his name on it because he thought no one would ever believe that he and I did it together. But I asked him, well, did we or did we not? He said, oh yeah, yeah, we, it was a mutual thing. We came up with all sorts of concoctions. Like suppose Don the holdout puts a, a stick down under his property <laughs> first before I get there or a stick up in the air, then I can't build a bridge because he was there first. And also what about the sunlight? If I put a bridge, wouldn't I be taking sunlight away from his crops? So we came up with a plastic see-through bridge. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the rain? Well, we came up with one of those grid things, you know, where the rain can come through. <laughs> so we, we, we came up with all sorts of objections to this and then all sorts of solutions to it to show that private property rights are such that you don't need the government to exercise um, these kinds of... Uh, 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 naked aggression or, or stealing stuff. I just wanted to say a few words um, in closing on this debate that I had with um, 
at Richard Epstein. The debate so much didn't really get in on so much on eminent domain. It rather switched to anarchism. The, the reason for it is that I favor eminent domain or I favor expropriation if it's agreed upon in advance. For example, if you live in a condominium development, you can, some of those condominium developments are really weird. You cannot put the color curtains you want. You have to put green ones. You can't put a picket fence. You have to have this kind of a fence. You certainly can't paint the exterior of your house pink with polka dots as you would like. I can see, you know, the, you're that kind of guy. Since you're sitting on the front, I'll pick on you. It's only fair. The reason for this is to reduce the so-called external diseconomies. Because otherwise, I could paint my house pink and blue polka dots and ruin the value of your property. So what, what a condominium association is, is an agreement where we tie each other up contractually so that no one can do this, this sort of weird stuff without permission of the majority of the condo development. So could a condo development have an eminent domain? Well, yeah, if, the, if that was part of the contract. So then the debate revolved, well, is the US a big condominium development? If so, then we've already agreed. And my argument was that we're not. And here I rely on my main man, Spooner. Why Sanders Spooner? Who wrote this magnificent little booklet, No Treason. Um, just a, a minute on anarchism. Look, if I go over and punch Don and take his wallet, this is wrong. It's the initiation of violence against an innocent person. Suppose three of us go to Don's house and we're about to walk away with his TV set. And Don protests. He says, but it's my TV set. And we're philosophical robbers, so we're willing to dialogue with him. We say, okay, okay, Don, not so, don't be so upset. We'll have a democratic vote. And I got three members in my gang. I say, okay, everyone who thinks we should take Don's TV, raise your hand. And me and my buddies raise our hand. And we're fair. And we say, okay, everyone who thinks we shouldn't, say, raise your hand now. And Don says no. And we beat him four to one. Well, is, <laughs> that's just silly. Right? I mean, the essence of it is that we're using naked aggression on him. And a majority vote doesn't make it right. Hitler came to power with a democratic election. So, so what for democracy? Foo on democracy. All the government is, is an invasive force based on democracy, based on force. Take a case where they just started the country and they go to this guy in Ohio, out in the sticks somewhere, and I say, hey, guess what? We started this new group, this new condo group, this club called the United States government. And the guy in Ohio says, oh, that's a wonderful PR name. Uh, I wish you luck. Uh, you know, uh, we'll be good neighbors. And you say to him, well, you don't understand, we're coming for taxes. <laughs> and the guy says, well, you know, I don't really want to join your club. And we say, okay, well, then leave. He says, leave? I've, I've been here 50 years. I'll be a good neighbor. Leave me alone. And we say, no, no, no. You're part of it whether you like it or not. That's what government is. You have to join the gang. Join the group. Against your will. Therefore, we are not part of a voluntary club called the United States government. Therefore, eminent domain is not justified in this country. I rest my case.